Hello and welcome to Red Red. Today I want to talk about The Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe. This is his 1964 novel and probably his most popular novel because it was uh, adapted and made into a uh, cult classic film, which I think he actually also wrote the screenplay for. But uh, that I think that makes it like the third book on this channel in a row that I have, that I'm talking about that was made into a classic film that I have not yet seen. But yeah, it is his most popular novel. It came out seven years before uh, The Boxman, which I have talked about on this channel. And I will get back to that uh, book shortly, actually, uh, because uh, just to kind of point out some comparisons. But yeah, uh, before I jump into talking about the book, I'll talk about some quick biographical information on Kobo Abe, uh, just insofar as it's relevant to this book. Uh, basically, he was born in Japan, but he was raised in uh, Mukden, Manchuria, which is sort of like northeast China, uh, inner Mongolia. Some of the important experiences that happened in his uh, in his upbringing are that. A, he would suffer certain fevers and hallucinations, kind of akin to, I guess, the H.P. Lovecraft and uh, or maybe also Franz Kafka, uh, that would go on to inform a lot of his writing, especially in The Box Man, but you also see it in The Woman in the Dunes as well. Uh, and he had some other passing interests, of course. Uh, the most important one for this one is uh, entomology and insect, collect or insect collecting. Uh, during Japan's Second World War, he was actually studying medicine, A, out of uh, filial piety, but also B, as an attempt to like try and get out of serving in the war. Uh, after the war finished and he got his degree, he, he never ended up practicing and he just continued to write full time. He did join Japan's Communist Party after the war because, you know, he wasn't satisfied with the imperialism that led to Japan's side in the war, uh, but he ended up falling out with the Communist Party as well, particularly because of a statement of him defending the oppression that some communist writers were feeling around, I think, the mid-60s, which was probably informed by the fact that he was sort of raised in China as well. But yeah, for, his, for the rest of his life, he continued to write. He was a, a playwright, and he also directed an avant-garde theatre, uh, and he uh, passed away in 1993. But yeah, so now I'll talk about The Woman in the Dunes. I'll give a just a surface level plot summary. I'll talk about uh, some key points or topics that I want to explore and then I'll just go through these sort of uh, reading notes. But yeah, the main idea of The Woman in the Dunes is that it follows a main character whose name is Nikki Junpei. He goes away to, on a vacation to uh, this seaside village in Japan. Uh, very importantly, you know, it is a very desert. There's lots of these like sweeping sand dunes and he's uh, the reason that he goes is just for a quick holiday or vacation, supposedly, is that he is looking and trying to find a unique bug or insect, uh, specifically a desert beetle, that will uh, sort of secure his fame because he will have his name placed next to that new uh, classification of a beetle. Uh, when he is there, he meets and he's talking to this old man who is just sort of asking why he's here, what he's doing, uh, if he's a government official, and he, and uh, he's sort of really hamming it home. He's like, are you anyone of importance? And Nikki Junpei is like, no, 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 I'm no one important. Don't worry about it. And the old man is like, mm, okay. Uh, and so the old man's like, oh, how are you going to get home the last bus is already gone why don't you stay here for a little bit and he's like oh yeah all right sure I don't mind um I can be I can be hospitable hospitable and I won't look a gift horse in the mouth um uh so the old man takes him to like kind of leads him to this area and this like sunken down crevasse almost where there are these little houses the most important one there is a a woman who is living there and he stays there overnight and he, but he sees that she kind of gets up and she starts like shoveling the sand away. At some point, they also bring uh, some sand, uh, like a shovel and a canteen for uh, the other one, uh, which is referring to him, uh, implying that he's also got to move the sand. He's learning about sand. He's sort of thinking about this. Uh, he's thinking about the nature of sand and some cool introspective things that I'll, I'll get into when I'm reading extracts. But uh, yeah, for the purpose of the plot, basically, he becomes a prisoner and in his being stuck down here because he can't climb, they've taken away the rope ladders and everything, he progressively starts to inspect himself, uh, 
and the, like the the themes are pretty obvious you know he start he's an entomologist he's studying he captures insects you're pretty quickly meant to just kind of translate that to him inspecting himself almost insect like stuck in this little thing uh, he does have some escape attempts but eventually what happens is that you know he uh, realizes not only the futility of uh, you know having to sweep sand away but also just the fact that that futility is uh, representative of just everyone's everyday life of going to work and so on and so forth uh, which is why uh, Kobo Abe is often thought of as a Jap uh, as a Japanese Kafka because he does have a like yes he has some surrealist images but he's also commenting on the sort of everyday uh, working condition and the toil of the toils and struggles of everyday life um yeah that's just general uh, surface level plot. The themes that I want to explore in this book are uh, the most important one, which actually relates to all of uh, most, if not all of these little tags on the side is actually anthropomorphization in descriptions. So one of the things that stood out to me is that the more that this character is uh, stuck and is a prisoner, the more he starts to describe things as insect-like. And there are some really cool uh, descriptions that I, I want to read. Uh, the disqualification by the narrator of its main character. This is this is quite unique, and I think that uh, and it and it refers to the first paragraph or the first chapter, really. Which basically it doesn't start with our character going to the woman in the dunes. It start it just has one chapter that talks about this person going missing <clears throat> and all of the speculations by co-workers and people saying oh why he could go missing and so on and it's very much just like uh, it's never really a big tragedy they talk about how someone who's you know studies entomology has obviously got to have a, a per perverted uh, mentality or mind frame or outlook on life and pretty pretty much everyone is just happy to be like oh yeah he's just gone missing who cares uh, and then story starts proper he goes he arrives at this seaside town and so on uh, and the last thing that I, uh, the last point that I want to talk about really is the author's general logic and the way in which he constructs as uh, paragraphs or connects paragraphs. And uh, this was something that has, uh, stood out. I'll probably start with that actually because it relates to the woman in the, uh, it relates to the box man. But um, I love Kobo Abe so much. Like I do. Uh, like reading uh, Ryunosuke Aktagawa, I do love his short stories. I like uh, writing short stories myself, and uh, so I felt that uh, there's while there's a lot that I like in the while there's a lot that I admire in Aktagawa, there are certain passages that I read uh, when I read Kobo Abe that I feel like there are. I know this is a grand sweeping statement, but I feel like there are some sentences that an author would just never write uh, unless they saw the world exactly the same way that you do. And uh, of course, you know, there's of course, Kawabe is a lot more talented than me. But uh, one of the one of the sentences or phrases that stuck in my mind so much, I want to read a, a segment from the Box Man, and. Uh, it, just for some context, you don't need to know anything about the plot, but uh, for the context of this quote or this section, uh, the man who is the box man, who is living in a box because he is a box man, uh, is being asked to give up his box, but he needs just one thing. And I'll just read this for you. Strictly speaking, I need just one thing in order to get out of the box, but it's indispensable. I can't leave the box if I don't have it. Do you understand? A pair of trousers. If I were just in trousers, somehow I could go out into the world. It would make no difference whether I was na naked from the waist up and my feet bare just as long as I had trousers on. Otherwise, if you go walking around the streets without trousers, no matter how new your shoes are or how elegant your coat, it's enough to raise a big hue and cry. Enlightened society is some kind of trouser society. And that is a, that is a sentence that is burned into my head that I will never ever forget because and it made me really just think like, wow, I love Kobo Abe so, so much because in The Box Man, he does, uh, he takes the sort of uh, introspection, but uh, a distant observation of society to the extreme uh, with, you know, our main character and uh, like the people, the box men basically uh, are disqualifying themselves and removing themselves from society. 
Um, but there are similar passages and the, the logic in the way that Abe constructs entire paragraphs, the way that he will go on tangents, the way that he will have the main character talking to himself and having conversations with uh, like the professor, the Mobius professor, uh, who must have probably invented the Mobius strip, but who is, is not really a character. Uh, there is a lot of surreal kind of magical realism, but a lot of explorations into, uh, I, I think about it almost like non-Euclidean logic. I just love it so much. And I think that there are some passages that I'll get to and read that you will read and you'll just think like, uh, I can't believe this man wrote this. Like, I cannot believe he had this thought. Uh, and I really, really admire that because there are things that you'll read that are so technically beautiful and so technically pulled off Sometimes when I uh, read Borges, I just think, I can't believe someone is so well read that they've connected this many things, but on the kind of sentence by sentence uh, scale, I can I can believe it. It's not ununderstandable. Uh, Kobo Abe, on the other hand, seems to have this magical quality for me of choosing analogies, metaphors, descriptive devices that seem to resonate so strongly and have so much metaphysical uh, like background that I I just can't believe that he wrote this stuff. And I think a lot of people maybe feel that with uh, Kafka or, or, or feel that with um, Haruki Murakami. Uh, I don't necessarily feel that. I feel like Murakami... I feel like there is a similar easiness, but there's just a really particular sort of nerve that Kobo Abe hits for me, where I feel like uh, his, I feel like he just exactly pinpoint hits these really wild, weird metaphors that resonate so strongly for me. Uh, and I can see why people would feel that with Murakami, even if I don't necessarily, I, I feel like I can see the... I can see the relaxedness in the Murakami that I've read, which really is only Norwegian Wood and Kafka on the Shore, whereas uh, in this one it feels like uh, Kobo Abe's descriptions are sort of inevitable, which really is just like a, a kind of, which really is just an indication of how great of a writer he is. But anyway, that's pretty much it. I'm going to jump through and talk about, actually I'll skim through and talk about really quickly all of the uh, uh, examples of anthropomorphization and then I'm going to jump back and talk about some sentence highlights and things that I really like. So here's actually an early example. Maybe maybe this is a literary reference to uh, uh, Aktagawa's The Spider's Thread but when he's talking to the old man sort of telling him what he's doing here, uh, looking down he spat, the old man did. Or perhaps it would be more exact to say he let the spittle ooze from his mouth, snatched from his lips by the wind, it sailed out in a long thread, which sounded a lot like the sort of spider's thread, and would obviously lead into the fact that the old man living uh, living above uh, is the one who could hypothetically send the ladder down to, to save him. And so this is when he is stuck down in there. He, uh, for a period, he uh, pretends that he is sick because he doesn't want to work. He's sort of in denial. And... Uh, one thing that uh, one thing that he writes is this: certain types of insects and spiders, when un unexpectedly attacked, fall into a paralytic state, a kind of epileptic seizure. Uh, an airport whose control tower has been seized by lunatics. A fragmented picture. He wanted to believe that his own lack of movement had stopped all movement in the world, the way a hibernating frog abolishes winter. And that's something that plays in is that when he's stuck down there, for all intents of for all intents and purposes, that is the whole world. There's there's nothing else going on. Some funny ones. This, there's going to be some rapid fire ones, but just like just hear them and just think: Would you ever describe a person or a thing like this? The woman curled her toes tightly inward. They looked like the suction cups of a suckfish. He laughed, and as he was laughing, he became nauseated. Uh, in a section, he's actually tied the woman up uh, as a way to try and ransom her to the village people and just be like, hey, you know, come and save me or, or she's going to she's gonna get it. Uh, she, she gets like sore. The woman suddenly doubled up like a wasp laying eggs. Under his disappointed skin, a thousand centipedes began to struggle. 
He was like an animal who finally sees that the crack in the fence it was trying to escape through is in reality merely the entrance to its cage, like a fish who at last realises, after bumping its nose numberless times, that the glass of the goldfish bowl is a wall. The pupils of his eyes were compressed to pinpoints and his belly began to throb like a jellyfish. Apparently he had dozed off for a moment, rolling over in the sweat and secretions which smelled like rancid fish oil, and this next one is my absolute favourite. <laughs> because, so, I don't have a very, very strong uh, uh, visual, I don't have very strong visual faculties, uh, kind of like borderline aphantasic, and what, uh, and so one thing that I find is that if I read a passage that feels very physical, I like to try and just physically act it out so that I can understand, like if someone laughs in a guffaw, I'll just be like, you know, and I'll try and do the movement to uh, kind of paint the image a bit more clearly. And, and, and just imagine my reaction then when I read this, this sentence. When he asked him for just a swallow of water, the man scowled at him, making a face like a grasshopper, and rushed off. His vocal cords were shredded like strands of dried squid. The woman was glowing from within now as if she were being washed by a wave of fireflies. All right, here's another allusion back to the old man, the spittle. All his nerves strained towards the rope as he pulled it gently toward, toward him, as if he were pulling on stars with a strand of a spider's web. And this is another one. This is like, why exactly? Why exactly write this? He rose like a toy monkey climbing a toy coconut tree. There's, he has this, for me, he has this ability to resist being juvenile or, or resist being bland. And this is one that I love, okay? Just, uh, I, if I said to you, I'm going to pay you a dollar for every single time for each new way in which you describe a cloud. I want you to just look up at the clouds, describe it. Uh, you could probably describe it like a blanket, like sheep, like whatever. Uh, how, how many dollars do you think you would make before you described clouds that resembled frogs' eggs seemed to be stalling, unwilling to sink? An anthropomorphization that sort of leads into hallucinating as well. And at the sound of the bell, his heart jumped a beat, his paws opened, and a thousand prickly little insects like grains of rice came crawling out. Obviously not literally happening, but... Even his feeling of shame vanished like the shriveled ash of a dragonfly's wing. And yeah, the very obvious one, this is on one of the last pages, but to eyes with magnifying lenses, everything seemed tiny and insect-like. And so, yeah, just to give you an example of how, like, really hammering home uh, it is that Abe is uh, using this, like, entomorphization is not, is not a word, but, uh, like, anthropomorphization specifically relating to insects, and, um, uh, the thing is, like, it might sound juvenile, me just, like, banging through and reading them all in a row, but it is really, really organic, the way in which he introduces it, and, and, like, really develops it, and it gets stronger as the novel progresses. Now I think I'm just going to uh, jump through, talk about some of the re the extracts uh, and and some of the and some of the standout sentences that I like. Some of these sentences similar to enlightened society, some kind of trouser society that I just uh, I just adore so much. Early on, he's meditating on the nature of sand and the fact that sand is always in motion. It's fundamentally very clean because it's not really ever staying anywhere. Bacteria can't build on it because sand is always moving. He really fascinates on this whole, uh, you know, one eighth of a millimeter is like a grain of sand. Because winds and water currents flow over the land, the formation of sand is unavoidable. As long as the winds blew, the rivers flowed, and the seas stirred, sand would be born grain by grain from the earth, and like a living being, it would creep everywhere. The sands never rested. Gently but surely, they invaded and destroyed the surface of the earth. The very fact that it, it had no form, it being sand, of course, uh, the very fact that it had no form was doubtless the highest manifestation of its strength, was it not? And another one, things with form were empty when placed when placed beside sand, uh, the only certain factor was its movement. Sand was the antithesis of all form. There is, you know, I don't know if this is, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this or if I'm sort of giving him uh, too much credit, but there is a, some early hallucinations of him starting to uh, uh, synthesize senses uh, as he is getting progressively uh, stuck down there, as, as, he, as his uh, stay down there is progressing. 
Somewhere a cock crowed and a bull lowed shrilly, but in the sand hollow there was neither distance nor direction. The ordinary normal world was outside, where children played, kicking stones along the roadside, and where roosters proclaimed the end of night at the proper time. The colours of dawn were beginning to mingle with the fragrance of cooking rice. And uh, this is an, a nice just sort of one-liner, just another thing, uh, uh, another analogy that I would love to have thought of myself. Uh, like I said, there's a period where he's pretending to be ill because he doesn't want to, to work. And he writes, Certainly pretending to be ill was no fun. It was like holding a taut spring enclosed in your hand, which is probably also like trying to maintain an accent or something. But again, get ready, get ready. This is another, uh, another wild sentence. Uh, so the woman is trying to seduce him. She wants him to stay because she wants, uh, uh, she had a husband and, and son. Allegedly, there's not really ever any trace of them, uh, but she is alone. She wants him to stay down there uh, to continue working and to live with her. And uh, let me, let me read. Suddenly, she became a silhouette cut out from its background. A man of 20 is sexually aroused by a thought. A man of 40 is sexually aroused on the surface of his skin. But for a man of 30, a woman who is only a silhouette is the most dangerous. He's reading the newspaper, and even though there's a lot of, uh, like, kind of interesting or, or tragic things that are happening, he writes... There wasn't a single item of importance. Specifically, he's looking in the paper to try and see if anyone has mentioned that he is missing. A tower of illusion, all of it, made up of illusory bricks and full of holes. If life were made up only of important things, it really would be a dangerous house of glass, scarcely to be handled carelessly. But everyday life was exactly like the headlines, and so everybody, knowing the meaninglessness of existence, sets the center of his compass at his own home. And this is funny, this is one of those sentences that evades being juvenile only just like only just and i really admire it he sank into an unbearable self-aversion with the thought that among the glum and gray people other than he had colors other than gray red blue green and there's something about the fact that he goes on to just list colors makes it make sense leading into the theme of observation and observing oneself. So, uh, Nikki Junpei is married, but I think it's alluded to that he's just sort of living with this, uh, with a person who is referred to as the other woman. And he's talking about the experience of being with her. This was an experience he had not had with the other. On that bed with the other one, they had been, they had been a feeling man and a woman, a watching man and woman. They had been a man who watched himself experiencing and a woman who watched herself experiencing. They had been a woman who watched a man watching himself and a man watching a woman watching herself, all reflected in counter mirrors, the limitless consciousness of the sexual act. Sexual desire with a history of some hundred million years from the Amobia on, on up is fortunately not easily worn out. But what he needed now was a voracious passion, a stimulation that would sweep his nerves into the woman's loins. Taking a moment for almost transcendent sincerity, he writes, beautiful scenery need not be sympathetic to man, and then skipping a little bit forward, the beauty of sand, in other words, belonged to death. It was the beauty of death that ran through the magnificence of its ruins and its great power of destruction. This is a funny moment. This is another uh, narrator writing camaraderie that I feel with the author uh, at the point that during an escape attempt, he thinks that he's evading the villagers who are chasing him, but they actually lead him to a, a, a like, it's pretty obvious and on the nose, but like a sinking, uh, sinking sand. And when he's in there, his jaw dropped open and he gave an animal-like cry, help. The stock expression. Well, let it be a stock expression. What was the use of individuality when one was on the point of death? And near the very end, he's reached this really almost like transcendental level of just observing himself. He's seeing and observing the woman as well from this kind of grand perspective. And uh, there's this part where he's sort of reading and he's just laughing. He's just like insanely laughing. The woman laughed reluctantly, but it was probably only to be agreeable. He was thinking about the vast network of water veins creeping up through the sand, but the woman, on the contrary, was surely thinking that his actions were sexual advances. That was alright. Only a shipwrecked person who has just escaped drowning could understand the psychology of someone who breaks out in laughter just because he is able to breathe. And skipping down a little bit... You can't really judge a mosaic if you don't look at it from a distance. If you really get close to it, you get lost in detail. You get away from one detail only to get caught in another. Perhaps what he was seeing up until now was not the sand, but grains of sand. And that's pretty much all I want to talk about with The Woman in the Dunes. I really liked reading it, uh, even though uh, the box man is just like, 
uh, Abe was like, let's just go completely unhinged. And uh, I, even though I, I like, I do prefer the box man uh, over the woman in the dunes. I can see that it is a really, really great novel. I think the, the developing arc, like the woman in the dunes makes a lot more sense. Uh, that much is for sure uh, than the box man. But the box man is just this series of like schizophrenic information that I really, really loved reading. But yeah, let me know what are some other Kobo Abe books. I do, I, like I know there's, I think it's called The Face of Another and there's also The Ruined Map. But these are the only two I've read. Considering how much I've loved both of them, I'm sure I'm going to get some more and read some more. So please give me some recommendations for ones that you like. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.